Thank you, John. And my health and welfare self-audit is in desperate need of updating now. And to manage your expectations, I am not going to stay within my 15 minutes. I practiced, and it's going to be at least 18 minutes, and I'm going to go very quickly. What I want to do is take you through the high points. One thing to keep in mind at the outset is the term grandfathered plan. If you had a plan that was in existence on March 23rd, 2010, you're considered a grandfathered plan. And what that means is that certain provisions do not apply to you. Also, if your health care plan was maintained pursuant to a collective bargaining agreement, in effect, prior to 323-2010, then that plan is grandfathered until the last of the collective bargaining agreements applicable to that plan expires. What exactly does that mean? Not sure yet. Another thing that's very interesting as you read through the Act is that there's no standard definition of large or small employer. If you think about 5500s, Large plan, more than 100 participants. Small plan, less than 100 participants. If you have less than 100 participants, don't think you're a small plan. In certain aspects, you're considered a large plan or an applicable employer. Provisions that are effective immediately is the tax credit for small employers. Here, a small employer is 25 full-time equivalent employees. There's a definition of what a full-time equivalent employee is. There's a lot of information on the IRS website about the tax credit, and it's worthwhile to go and see that. Adoption credit. If you have an adoption plan, that credit's been increased from 10000 to 13170 There's a provision in the law that is effective immediately that has taken a lot of HR people by some H HR people by surprise, and that is reasonable break time for nursing mothers. And that is effective immediately. For some large employers, you've already got it. If you have less than 50 employees, you can be exempt if it causes undue hardship. So you're going to have to demonstrate what undue hardship is. Mention briefly about this age 26, age 27. The age 27 comes into play with respect to imputed income. What the law has done has ex ex excluded from income the cost of dependent coverage up until the year the dependent attains age 27. And I'm going to give you an example later about that. Automatic enrollment. This is where you'll have a disagreement as to what the effective date. John's slide said 2014. If you look in the act, there is no effective date. Some people will say 2014 when everything else kicks in. Other people will say, well, there's no, effect, there's no effective date, so it's going to kick in immediately. Others will say it kicks in when the regulations come around. And automatic enrollment is for employers with 200 or more full-time employees. If you offer a choice of health plans, you're going to be expected to automatically enroll your employees, pick a default plan, automatically enroll them, new employees this is. And with that, you're going to have to give them notices and allowing them to opt out if they choose to. Medicare Part D, employers who have received a subsidy can no longer deduct that subsidy. And what that means, and this is some of the things that you've seen in the newspaper for some of the larger employers, it affects their financial statements this year. Provisions effective three months after enactment, or 621, is the early retiree reimbursement pool, which Henry spoke about. So if you have offer an employment-based plan, early retiree plan for early retirees 55 to 64, you can apply for reimbursement it's first come, first save basis. The pot is $5 billion right now. You get one of these large unions in, the $5 billion is practically gone. So if you want it, make sure you read the regs. They just, something just came out, I think it was this week, and read it, find out what you have to do, wait for the application. If you're going to do it, get, get your application in right away. Another thing that's supposed to happen this year is, within three months, is the temporary high risk pool. This temporary high risk pool is going to be established for those individuals not eligible to obtain coverage and who have been without coverage for six months. The interesting point with this temporary high risk pool is that HHS is going to determine criteria, is going to establish criteria to determine whether or not an individual is not in their employer plan because they were provided incentives not to elect it and if those incentives were provided 
because it was based on the individual's health coverage. It might be kind of hard to prove, but if it's proven and the employee goes to this high risk pool, and if m benefits are paid out of the high risk pool, the employer is going to get charged for it. It's going to be interesting. The following are going to be for plan years beginning six months after the enactment date. So if you have a 10-1 plan year, these are the provisions that are going to apply to you. And they apply to everyone, whether or not you're grandfather or not, with one exception, and I'll point that out. No pre-existing coverage exclusion for children under age 19. No rescission of coverage due to fraud or mis except due to fraud or misrepresentation. I'm really not sure how that affects group plans. No lifetime limits on the dollar value of essential benefits. Problem one, we don't have a definition of what essential benefits is. You can place restrictions on non-essential benefits, but we have to wait for regulations there. It appears as though for plan years beginning before 2014, you can place reasonable restrictions on annual limits, but not lifetime dollar limits. Again, we don't know what reasonable restrictions means. Think of in terms of, let's assume chiropractic. Can you place limits on chiropractic? Chiropractic is determined to be a non-essential benefit. Yes, you can. We just need regulations here. Medical loss ratio. I think you, you've heard that. Apparently, what's going to have to happen is insurance companies are to submit a report to HHS. Rebates are going to have to be provided to enrollees if the medical loss ratio is less than 85% for the large market. Here, the large market is plans with 101 or more employees. And, 80, and, and 80, the medical loss ratio has to be 80% for the small market. Should have no effect on self-insured plans. We're not clear how the ratio is going to be calculated. There's a lot of debate right now because there's a premium component, there's an administrative component, and what the insurance companies are trying to figure out and, and are lobbying for is, well, you know that the helpline that you have uh, where a person can call a nurse and get some guidance? They don't want that classified as administrative because it really should be on the claim side. So there's a lot that has to be worked out here. We don't know the components of it, how it's going to be calculated, and how the rebates are going to be distributed. Pending coverage. Dependent coverage has caused more confusion than you can imagine. If a plan, first of all, you don't have to provide dependent coverage. But if you provide dependent coverage, you have to continue it up until the time the adult child attains age 26, whether or not the child is married. Now, grandfathered plans don't have to provide it if the adult child has employment-based coverage elsewhere. Now, IRS guidance was issued, and the IRS guidance is 2010-38, and it provides examples. And I'll just, I'll just give you one of the examples now, where a participant, where an, a dependent child turns 26 on November 15, 2010. This was an example in the regs. You only have to provide coverage up until that date. What gets tricky is, if you have a plan that's in a state that requires a higher age, you're subject to the state laws. This is where the imputed income will come in. The, there's an exclusion from income up until the year the child attains 27. That's confusing. So if the child attains 27 in 2011, the imputed income exclusion is only good up until 1231, 2010. This is what is blowing people's minds because it's really complicated. In the notice, they provide very good examples on how to do it. Another thing that's been a complicated, complicating factor with this provision is, okay, fine, but what do we do about our cafeteria plan? Because we can't make changes to the cafeteria plan. If someone didn't have a dependent, and now we can, or they maxed out because they were no longer a student, and we add them back in, can we allow the participant to go in and increase their contribution rate for this? This new notice that came out said that you can amend your plan, and what's really interesting is the IRS is encouraging retroactive, is encouraging early implementation of this. They are allowing retroactive amendments to cafeteria plans. If you choose to do this, implement this provision early, you have to amend your plan no later than 1231-2010. One thing to keep in mind throughout this whole entire healthcare reform is how are you going to communicate this to your participants? When and what are you going to communicate? So suppose you are not 
a grandfathered plan, what provisions are applicable to you? Well, you have to provide first dollar coverage for preventive services. Emergency service has to be covered without prior authorization. Out of network expenses have to be covered the same as in net network expenses. No referral for OBGYN. The participant is going to be able to designate a primary care physician as well as a pediatric primary care physician. Appeals process. Well, you say to yourself, we've already got an appeals process. The element that this adds is it adds an external review appeals process to this. And it's supposed to be modeled after the NAIC guidelines, and it, it's going to be yet to be developed. Insured plans are subject, let me rephrase that. Self-insured plans are subject to non-discrimination rules under Internal Revenue Code Section 105H. I hate to do code speak for you, but in this case, it's the only way to do it. Insured plans have been able to discriminate against, in favor of highly compensated employees because they were not subject to the 105H non-discrimination rules. What this does is it says we're leveling the playing field. Insured plans are going to be subject to the 105H rules, but it's not applicable if you're, gran if you're a grandfathered plan. Another thing is guaranteed renewability. Once you get the coverage, you're guaranteed to have it renewed. Provisions effective 1 1 2011, W 2 reporting. You're going to have to start reporting on your W 2 the value of coverage provided to a participant. Start working with your payroll vendors. A lot of them are already working on that right now. At first, I thought, you know, well, okay, fine, we have time with this. But then uh, my understanding is that if an employee terminates, they can request a W 2 earlier. I'm not that familiar with that rule, but check with your payroll provider or your, your payroll folks and find out when is your due date. It might be earlier than you think to get this up and running. CLASS. CLASS is the Community Living Assistance Services and Supports Program. This is a voluntary long-term care program. The government is expecting employers to automatically enroll people in it. The participants can opt out if they choose to. If a participant chooses to opt out of it, they can't get back in until the next open enrollment. If they choose to be in the program, they can't get out of it unless it's for failure to pay premiums. The interesting thing about this class act is that it, there's a five-year vesting program, the five-year vesting to it, so the employee pays in, but they're not going to get anything until they're vested for five years. They've been doing it for five years. There's a laundry list of requirements as far as when you're going to be able, eligible for coverage. Right now, the benefit, and again, this is up in the air, is going to be something like $50 a day. And the goal is to keep them citizens in their home and not go into nursing homes. HSA, FSA, HRA changes. John already mentioned that over-the-counter prescription drugs cannot be paid out of an FSA or an HSA unless it's in a prescription or unless it's insulin. So over-the-counter drugs, unless they're in a prescription or unless it's insulin, can no longer be paid out of your FSA, HSA, or HRA. In addition, HSA payments that are made that are disqualifying payments, the excise tax is going to be increased from 10% to 20%. Another thing that's going to be effective 1 1 2011 is something called a simple cafeteria plan. Many employers, and these are really small employers, have not been able to implement a cafeteria plan because of the non discrimination rules. What you're going to be able to do right now is, or 1 1 2011, implement a simple cafeteria plan if you're an employer in either of the preceding years employed 100 or fewer employees on average. If you choose to implement this simple cafeteria plan, there's going to be a required employer contribution. And it's either going to be 2% or it's going to be the lesser of 200% of a matching contribution or 6% of comp. What this will get you is out of the non-discrimination testing for cafeteria plans. You will be deemed to satisfy them. When you develop this plan, there are certain employees that can be excluded. And it almost sounds along the lines of, of retirement plans, like 21 and 1, age 21 and 1 year of service. Now we come to 1-1-2012. In addition to the summary plan description that you provide to your particip participants, you're going to have to provide a four-page summary 
in 12-point font that's culturally, linguistically appropriate. And in those four pages, you're supposed to explain a laundry list of things in the, what the, is in the act. I'm not sure how that's going to be possible in four pages and in 12-point font. Well, we're supposed to be getting, again, supposed to be getting guidance on that. Also beginning in 2012 is if you're going to make changes to your health care plan, you have to provide 60 days advance notice unless for material modifications, not sure what a material modification is yet, unless that information has been described in the most recent summary of benefits. So you see there's going to be a lot of rules to be added to your reporting and disclosure calendar. Here's an interesting one. John mentioned this about the CER, Comparative Effectiveness Research. For plan years beginning after 9-30-12, insurance companies are going to have to contribute $2 per covered life for each health insurance, covered life under each health insurance policy. It appears if you're self-insured, the plan sponsor is going to contribute that. At the present time, it's a temporary program. And what this is supposed to do is provide a pot of money to look at what is the best treatment for a particular type of uh, illness diagnosis. Again, right now it's temporary. Don't know how long that will last. 1-1-2013. John mentioned this. Flexible spending health care accounts are going to be limited to $2,500. That will be indexed, so it will eventually move back up. Starting in 2013, employers are going to have to provide notices to employees explaining the availability of the exchanges. Also, 2013 is the year where that additional hospital insurance, that component of your Social Security tax, is going to be increased for people that make above a certain limit. 2014. This is as far as I'm going is 2014. I'm not going to go to 2018 and talk about the Cadillac plans because it's just way too far in advance. Thank you, Mary. <laughs> 2014, we're going to have plan mandates. We're going to have individual mandates. This is where the exchanges come into play, and this is where the employer shared responsibility comes into play. So what are some of the plan mandates? Pre-existing condition exclusion eliminated for all employees. So right now, it's just up to age 19. It's going to be for all employees. Clinical trials for qualified individuals. If you have an employee who is participating in a clinical trial, and the, clinical, the approved clinical trial is going to be posted on one of the government's websites, and I say one of the government's because the trouble with this law is you don't know, is it IRS, DOL, HS, HHS, or someone else. And that's, to Henry's point, it's, it was just a really different way to legislate. You're going to have to, the plan is going to have to cover typical costs associated with the clinical trials. And what this is trying to get around is insurance companies often don't reimburse for what's considered experimental treatment. So if it's an approved clinical trial, if the individual is a qualified individual, then the plan is going to have to pay for certain costs. Waiting periods can't exceed 90 days. There's going to be reporting to the IRS. Wellness programs, you're going to be able to increase the premium discount on well wellness programs up to 30%. There's going to be a lot of rules and regulations as far as what you're going to have to do to be able to do this. One thing I wanted to mention also is that effective 2011, there are grants available for small employers. And in this case, a small employer is less than 100 employees who work more than 25 hours per week, and the employer didn't have a workplace wellness program in effect prior to the date the law was enacted. Not sure what a workplace wellness means, but if you are a small employer and you want to implement a workplace wellness, there could be grants available to you. Individual responsibility. This is the year individuals have to start getting coverage. And if they don't get coverage, they're going to have to pay a penalty. Exchanges. This is the year states are going to set up exchanges. 
that's supposed to enable individuals who can't get coverage as well as small employers to get coverage. You've often heard the expression lately, pay or play. And I'm, I had to take, I have to tell you this. And this is where the employer shared responsibility comes in. And I believe Rich is going to talk a little bit about the penalties. So, and this is where it's important, where you keep in mind whether you're a large employer or a small employer. If you don't offer coverage for full-time employees or you offer minimum essential coverage that is unaffordable, and there's a definition for unaffordable, or you offer minimum essential coverage that consists of a plan under which the plan share of the total allowed cost of benefits is less than 60%, and this is an amount that's going to be actuarially determined, and there are going to be rules to figure out how you determine what the actuarial value is, and therefore what the 60% is going to be. So if you have, you have all those ORs, and if you have a full-time employee that goes to an exchange, is certified as being eligible for a subsidy, then you are going to get a bill for that employee. And this is what you're going to have to do. This is where the, the voucher comes into play. What's supposed to happen is the employee goes to the exchange. The exchange is going to determine based on household, you know, how, what their income is with respect to the federal poverty level, what the cost of the plan is, your plan with respect to income. If they're eligible for a voucher, the exchange is going to notify the employer the employer is going to have to pay the exchange an amount equal to what they would have paid had the employee elected coverage. If the plan that they elect in the exchange is less than the cost of this voucher, the employee gets to keep the difference. In this case, applicable employer is an employer that employs on average 50 full-time employees on business days in the preceding calendar year. And when you look at how you determine your full-time employees, you have to look at full-time equivalents. So you have to start looking at your part-time employees, add up to hours, divide it by 120. This is what's coming in 2014. So now you know why I'm not going further to 2018. One thing to keep in mind, there's no requirement that you have to offer employee any kind of group health benefits, but there are penalties if you don't. There's also an employee relations issue. And just as an aside, employers have an expect, if you're thinking of dropping your plans, employees have an expectation of employee benefits. And what I've heard, and, and I'll, I'll defer to Henry on this, is that you could be, if you choose not to offer health insurance, you could be opening the door for unions. And I could go on much longer, but I won't. <laughs> 